Hi, I'm your host, Anand J. Sukadia, and this is the Limitless One Podcast. Join me on this journey as I interview the most inspirational souls who are tapping into their limitless blueprint on a mental, physical, and spiritual level to thrive in uncertain times. If you feel you are so much more than just this body, just this life, and want to tap into your limitless potential, you're in the right place. Here we go, Starseeds. Would you like to know the secrets of success from an entrepreneur that has successfully launched five startups and travels the world full time so he can do what he wants when he wants? Creating a life of limitless choice is possible. And our guest today will give us an insight into how he did it at such a young age. Welcome to the Limitless One podcast. I am your host, Anand J. Sukadia. Michael Perez, or as his friends call him, Mikey, is a serial entrepreneur, software engineer, journalist, author, and radio host, best known for founding various technology, media, and news startups. As a regular contributor to reputable news publications such as Entrepreneur and Times of Israel, Perez leverages his experience to advise inspiring entrepreneurs in developing the mindset to build, grow, and scale successful businesses. With respect to corporations, Perez has developed a reputation for building and preparing news publications for early stage funding. Perez resides in Seattle, Washington, and is currently the chief editor of Perez Daily, Breaking 9 to 5, and Israel Now News. Welcome to Limitless One Podcast, Michael. How are you doing? Thank you, Anand. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you for having me, and I'm doing great. Excited. Yeah, I'm for so this. excited to get into uh, to learning about you and having our audience learn everything they can from uh, such an accomplished entrepreneur. We were actually introduced by a mutual friend. So, um, you know, I don't know too much about your story, but really excited to dig deep into it. Um, so to start off, usually I ask my guest, what does living a limitless life mean to you? To me, at least, it means that there's a constant lack of complacency. So I know limitless sounds like amazing, but at the same time, uh, you also never want to get comfortable because there's always something beyond your current horizon. So uh, what it means to me today is likely going to be very different than what it means to me tomorrow. Awesome. Yeah. Living in the present moment is... Uh so valuable and on a much higher level it's a it's a spiritual way of living but uh yeah i know you have uh so many different things you're working on that uh, you have to be present you can't just be like single single focused um yeah so yeah. let's get into your background and tell me a little bit about you know how you became michael perez this day and age and all the things you've accomplished honestly you know the more i get asked these questions and the more i do retrospection um the more i come to realize that my defining moments were really out of the toughest ones. And you don't even realize it once you go through it or even once you're out of it. But when you try to like dig deeper into your own psyche and figure out, hey, you know, some of these, some of these characteristics or traits that you have, where did they come from? Where did they develop? And you're like, oh, wow, they actually likely developed from childhood. So to answer your question, I think a lot of my mentality, uh, you know, in terms of my grit, my persistence, my lack of complacency really did come from my early days and as early as elementary school. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, tell us a little bit about how, how you know, yeah. How you, you know. yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, as in my very early days, I was diagnosed with ADHD alongside other learning disabilities and um, it came with a whole bunch of stuff. So I had to take Ritalin, slow release, strongest dose at the time. I'm not sure what it was. It was either 120 or 90 milligrams. And you know, for some people it worked really good. For me, it really didn't. So I had heart palpitations. I felt cold. There was depression. Uh, my body would be dying for food. My brain would be like, you're fine. And you'd almost be like in this zombie-like state. At first, I think my school thought and my parents also thought that I was like making it up to come home. So my mom like slept it in my food one morning. She said, oh, you're not taking it today. And she put it in my food and I came home that very day not feeling well. And then she's like, okay, I got to start taking this guy seriously. Um, but in any regard, as much as I went through a lot of troubles, the silver lining was significant and it kind of uh, superseded all the problems that I'd experienced. And the silver lining was that when it worked, it gave me a frame of reference. So it's kind of like shooting a, a dart in the dark. You'd miss all the time, but when you hit, you hit. And 
when whatever variables that it was triggered, what, that it was affecting kind of just all aligned properly, I was focused like never before. And to be honest, that understanding of what it means that where nothing else matters and all this noise, this background noise that for some people is truly subconscious, I guess for ADHD folks, it's a little more conscious to have that dissipate and be aware of it was, was a true epiphany uh, when I actually experienced it. So from there I realized, oh, wow. So, you know, you know it's hard for us to realize what we should be when we don't have that experience. And once I got that experience, I'm like, okay, now I have a milestone I want to work towards. As I started to kind of progress in my, in my education, I, I kind of left this, the childhood structure of having everything spoon fed to you where you start to do things you more or less, and that's how it works. When you, when you're in elementary school, you're forced to do kind of very standardized curriculums, but as you progress and you start to hone in on your very specific areas of interests, right? And as I started doing that, I started seeing kind of like a, this very interesting inversion where uh, I wasn't designed for the schooling system at all. So whenever there was, and the things that the schooling system at the very onset would reward you for were things I wasn't very good at. I wasn't organized. I didn't come on time. Um, I didn't have that, you know, that, that, that inherent structure that teachers looked for. Even more so, I had very strong learning disabilities in English and mathematics. So when the teacher would come in, and I'll get to my initial point in a moment, it's part of the ADHD package here. So uh, when the teacher would come in, I'd have to go to, I guess I would call it the stupid room, right, where the kids would have to get private attention in math and private attention in English. And it was, there was almost a sense of humiliation that came with being, having ADHD, let alone you have the learning disability. When you, I would have to go to the office to take my pill, the teacher would have to look at my mouth, and it was right in the hallway where all the students would see. Uh, every time the, the teacher would, our math teacher would come in, I'd have to go upstairs to a program called GEM. This was in Montreal, uh, in, a, in a Jewish, uh, in Jewish uh, upbringing in school. So the stigma that came with it and this coupled with the fact that I wasn't getting a standard secular education like your average student, like your average child was. I was going through this very religious process, um, put me at just a whole bunch of setbacks. And uh, just when I and when I started to progress forward into college, I realized, wow, uh, I am so behind. It is crazy. And it was all these problems, having learning disabilities, you know, being in this very uh, non-secular upbringing and then coming to college and being just miles behind everyone else um, would break people down. But, you know, even at even in elementary school and definitely towards high school, I started like realizing that the things I'm told don't always work best for me, but I do see them work good for other people. And then I started taking these tiny divergencies where I would do something slightly different than I should. And I'd be like, OK, this kind of works for me better than it works for this guy. And then I would double down and double down and double down. Now, to answer your question in a bigger picture, when you zoom out, that's what being an entrepreneur really is all about. It's about taking very strong risks for a sustained period of time, being, being, having the ability to weather that process. It comes with an element of confidence to know that you'll get through. And then when, this, when we segue into talking about serial entrepreneurship, you'll see how that even translates you know, to another level. This is a recursive concept, right? So when I started taking these, at very early age, I started taking these tiny risks and then getting confidence. And then when you look back and you see this track record, that, hey, these things just work out. Then you take bigger risks, you take bigger risks, you take bigger risks. It took me years to actually put this in perspective. So now, when I come to college and, and we're supposed to do Calculus One, and I can barely do algebra, uh, I'm a huge setback. And then I got to start being extremely creative in a very short period of time in order for me to catch up because I have just a few months before my grades come in. And I was in a program where you couldn't fail any courses. So I, my, my first degree was computer science. And you couldn't fail, if you failed a single course, you were out of the program. And the, and the fail rate inherently was extremely high. You know, for the first semester, it was about 75%. Wouldn't make it till the next semester. So. Um, that was a very tough time for me. And that was my first time where I, I really had to, um, it, I would say suffer. I mean, it was a lot of work, but eventually you fall in love with that sort of pain and mm -hmm. you almost miss it where you look back and you're like, this is crazy how much I can do in such a short period of time, right? I had to teach myself algebra. I had to teach myself all trigonometry, all these complex concepts that I didn't necessarily have any exposure to before. Um, and then I had a private tutor and I would get familiar with all the concepts of calculus and whatnot. Um, and even getting a decent grade on my first exam was very uplifting. And I think that's where my deep confidence comes from to continue to pursue all sorts of uh, endeavors today. It's a very long answer, but uh, I hope that's yeah.
Uh, absolutely amazing. I wasn't saying yeah to the long answer. I was saying uh, yeah because there's so many things to unpack here. First of all, you know our school system, you know math and science, or sorry, math and English. That's our SAT essentially. You know I think they've changed it since I was in school, but basically you would get, you know, you take this SAT, it'd be the same thing, mm-hmm. and you have two different scores: a math and science score, sorry, math and English score. So if you weren't good at either or one. Then you wouldn't get a high SAT score. You couldn't get into a good college. So there was like a, you know, just because you were good at two certain skills where there are thousands of skill sets out there in the world, right. you know, we, we are labeled such a, such a way that we're not, you know, intelligent or we're not right. good enough for this particular system. Secondly, the fact that you understood, hey, I'm a little bit different and let me diverge and take a different path. You know, it takes a lot of courage, especially at a young age and with your upbringing, because, you know, you had the ADHD diagnosis, you're taking the medicine and then, you know, you were at a secular, uh, secular or non-secular school. So you had to overcome a lot. You had to go through a lot of fires in your life. And it, that's what kind of like led you to becoming this strong, confident person is because if those things didn't break you down at any one of those things could have, you know, like turned off a kid from learning or for even trying to be ambitious in life, you know, a lot of people will then understand, okay, I have a problem. I'm going to play small and that's going to be my safe zone. But the fact right. that you pulled out of that, that's like the, really the magic of, of who you are. And like you were saying at the beginning, the biggest obstacles in your life turn out to be the biggest blessings. Right. And honestly, necessity is the mother of all invention. So I, mm-hmm. I can't even take credit for this behavior. I kind of didn't have a choice in order for me to survive within the system I was given. And back to your point about SATs, it's true because we live in an economy where having generalized skills doesn't get you very far. And having specialized skills is really is crucial for your success. And the problem with these standardized tests is that they put you on this very broad benchmark where you don't necessarily have to be a good writer to be an amazing rocket scientist, right? And if your math skills are exceptional, but your writing isn't exceptional, um, that shouldn't be something that's seen in isolation. Um, so I definitely agree with that. And I actually took my SAT, so my second degree. And, and I have to say that the things that scared me the most, writing and mathematics, were the things I actually fell in love with. And I majored, uh, well, I didn't major in writing, but I, I do right now quite a bit. Uh, but I majored in mathematics as well. And in fact, it was that structured thinking that held me back. And the moment I started getting into more, and, and I will say this, that I've, you know, when I got to college, I, you know, I, let me expand on my initial thought here. But when I got to college, I realized that listening to a teacher talk for an hour and a half wasn't working for me. After 10 minutes, I'd, you know, go crazy. So again, this is another example where I just, I got nothing against the schooling system. I think it works great. If you ask me, do the schooling system work for me? Flat out, no. Would I have, you know, and that's fine. And I got critique of it, but I don't know how I would make it better because it does work for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, that all being said, I just learned how to work with it. And instead of going to class, I would make good friends who are in my courses and I would just take their notes and I would reverse, essentially reverse engineer the course at each time. And the thing about really smart teachers is that they make their, their course load very much connected in terms of weight to how they create an, an exam. And the really smart teachers as well, uh, have deeper meanings in every question they ask. Like in mathematics, you'll have the same concept, but they'll just do some slight variation. And there's a mechanic in there they want you to pick up on. So the point I'm trying to make here is is that when I started looking at my friend's notes and learning the courses, I kind of moved away all the noise and all the wasted time that comes in being in a classroom setting. And I ended up getting a lot more output for my time. And as the courses got harder, you know, there was less of this, 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 structure that, you know, that really held me back in my early days. You know, when you're doing advanced courses in math, teachers don't really have time to to lecture and talk about your day and tell you to come on time. They don't care about that. They've got their grad students that they're working with. They send you the syllabus, the exam is coming. So as the courses got harder, my colleagues were complaining that the courses were becoming harder and they were complaining about the teachers. And I'm like, I don't care. This for me feels easier and easier and easier. So, you know, at some point I realized I had a strong sense of mastery on education coming out of all of it because I think I focused, I ended up focusing on what was more, what was most important. Amazing. Did you, do you feel like, because you had a, an early, like when you were younger, you had a lot of uh, love for software engineering and stuff. Did you find that like that kind of helped you, gave you like the, the, the bones of your, your kind of method for learning technologies or, or different subjects? 
Well, my room was my sanctuary, very much so. Uh, we lived in a big house in Montreal, fortunately, and I lived on the top floor. So I was very much isolated. And I grew up in a family of nine siblings. So I was one of nine. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, even then, you know, my mom would have put my dinner by my door and Joe would just come pick it up. And, you know, gratefully, I had, like, had to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, but honestly, Here's that was slap. my favorite. <laughs> Yeah, I would I would build computers in my room. I would learn how to do all this stuff. You know, I found what I loved and I stayed there. And, and a part of me, that's part of me, maybe what created this very introverted personality was because I was very happy in my alone space. Um, mm-hmm. So although I didn't really enjoy the very much um, religious upbringing, I definitely had a place that I felt I can grow and do science on my own because my community didn't necessarily reward this way of thinking too much. Um, yeah, and I held on to it. Now, to answer yeah, yeah, I certainly wanted to become a software engineer. And in a way, I was lucky because I knew exactly what I wanted to do very, very early on. But the funny thing is, is that I, I came to discover that what I love in computer science is more of a subset to something greater. And I think I don't even consider myself a programmer today as much as I spend over a decade programming. Uh, I would consider myself, uh, you know, I would consider myself as someone who enjoys leveraging computer science to express himself effectively in science. Um, and I do think that computer science was the greatest tool, but actually what I love is far deeper, and I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so now going, coming out of college, did you know immediately you wanted to be an entrepreneur or did you find like, you know, maybe yes. you wanted to go a different route, a safer route? I already knew that I do not work within these systems, you know, these old age systems of like working for a company nine to five in a cubicle, um, coming to class and the structure very early on there. Was, it was like, a, you know, there was no illusion of option. And I knew that I would have to make my own path. And especially I really was. I was building computers for everyone in my community. I was fixing uh, 150 computers every you know term for my entire high school for the boys division and then a completely different school for the girls division. So already I kind of had this entrepreneurial spirit as a technician. Amazing. Amazing. So then what was your first uh, entryway into you know business ownership? As early as elementary school, I had like a yep. setup. My house became a computer shop where everyone mm-hmm. would drop off their computers and then, okay, give me a week. And then they'd come pick it up and I would remove the virus. I would fix the computer. Or I would do the data recovery. Um, and um, I did try to do the nine to five. So I worked for a company called Chabad.org where I built their mobile apps. And I really loved it. It was a very good time. Mm-hmm. It's the biggest Jewish organization um, out there. And um Yeah, it was a great experience, but it definitely consolidated my mindset that, hey, you know, building your own situation is definitely where you're happier. And and now to reach out to the audience here, uh, I will say that, as you know, I've created the model breaking nine to five, and I don't necessarily think that's a better model. I think it comes down to the person. And I would never convince someone who enjoys that structure to get out of it, right? There are people out there who truly enjoy working nine. You know, those guys you message at like a Friday afternoon and they go, oh, you know, I, I don't have my work email with me. I'll respond to you Monday morning. Mm. That to me is a foreign concept. I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. But people like that structure. They like to know that the nine to five, they work, they come home, they kick it back. They've got that stability. They've got their vacations. Um, you know, they get to have their wine, watch the game and enjoy their life. Uh, and this is where I don't take credit good or bad for my personality. I do think deep down it's how we're wired. There's no reason why I wake up every morning and I'm willing to engage with this process because it's a very long-term investment. Now, you know, if that lifestyle just doesn't make you happy, there's no reason for it, right? You just don't enjoy pursuing someone else's dream. You almost feel like getting a job is like a price to sell your own aspirations, right? And people who do feel that way, then I go, hey, listen, we got a whole lot to talk about. But it truly is not one that's better than the other. And um, it's truly not a choice. You might not be happy with what you're in, but it really isn't a choice to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the, the, love the way that you say it. You're, you're selling your, your ambitions for, I guess, the safety of getting, you know, having right. that comfort of the job. Now, let's speak to the ones that do want to exit that nine to five and go into entrepreneurship or going into, towards their purpose. What can you what what can you offer them in terms of your experience and you know how they can go about that? All right, I really enjoy this conversation. So uh, I will say so. Um, first and foremost, if you do find yourself stuck in a job you don't truly love, 
it's extremely hard to get out of it. It's kind of, you've been structured where you just, there's no survival mechanism to leave the job. You have, you have a lot of us are month to month, month to month. And also, you know, it can take you four or five years to start getting real income, generally less, but it could take you that long. And you just, there's no platform where you can just quit your job and move forward. But actually I argue there kind of is. And, um, I call it the survival cost problem. I talk about it in some of my columns and I, I think the first thing to do is to realize that that when you graduate college, you've been sold into a trap, essentially, where you're lured in with all these benefits to work for these big tech companies. And I'm assuming you're in computer science or software engineering, but this applies to truly anything. Um, you, you realize, you know, you look at what the economy is offering. This engineering job is offering this much money. This engineering job is offering this much money. And it almost makes no sense when you have a starting salary of $120,000 to go and make $25,000 for your first year while you're working four times harder than everyone else. Um, but it's about the model you subscribe to. And when you subscribe to linear models, when you work for, for example, Google, as good as a job and as smart as you have to be to work at Google, you, you definitely grow with the company, but you grow in a linear fashion and eventually you hit this tenure and you kind of taper off. If you're trying to make millions and millions of dollars, there are very few people at Google who do that. You'll have a very comfortable salary, salary of four hundred fifty five hundred thousand dollars but after that, it kind of goes flat. And I think when you're subscribing to an exponential model, you make very little with a lot of energy, but you got to have that grit. And we were talking about entrepreneurship earlier on. You got to be able to weather that storm because you want to hit that inflection point. And when that inflection point happens, you look back, you go, oh, I get it, right? And that could take a few years. So the first thing you want to do is remove your dependency on your current job. Now, these are very simple questions you need to ask yourself. How much do you want you know, the success? How much do you want to have a job you truly love? Do you love it more than, than your current apartment? Do you love it more than partying on the weekends, right? Do you love it more than going to a restaurant five times a week? These are artificial costs. And even if you think about it, when you move to Silicon Valley, your rent is like 10 times more than it should be. And you've artificially yeah. kind of propped up all these costs you need to survive. And now you're trapped to keep in a job you don't want to. Well, if you really want to take control of your own future and start your own company, are you willing to move back into your mom for a year? You don't look very cool with your friends and your girlfriend, right? But what are you willing to give up to get it? We all want to be successful. That's not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is what are you willing to give up to get it? If you're willing to move back into your parents for a year, if you're willing to, to learn, start, you finish your job at 530, come home at 630, you have five solid hours to start honing a new skill. And you have the world at your fingertips. The internet, you have no excuse anymore. You can become a programmer in six months. You can take a boot camp session. You can spend two hours a night. You can give up your weekends. You can also remove your costs of survival. You can move in with your parents, save a ton on rent. You can start making your own food, save a ton on food. And this way you can, you can create savings that give you more headway once you quit your job, but you can also remove this, the, the core, um, What's keeping you prisoner essentially in your current job? And unless your survival costs now are $2,000 a month, you need to sustain your lifestyle, you can likely move that down to just a few hundred. Plus your savings, you give yourself a good six months gap where you could quit your job and have a very rough time, but then you head down a place that you're much happier. And in the long run, you're getting a lot more energy and that's a lot more return on your energy. And that's really how I look at it, right? Even when you're in the scaling space, it's all about how much you get back for what you put in. And when you do have a, when you do have your scope calibrated correctly, you know, you, you do start to focus on endeavors that give you a whole lot of ROI. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's all about the commitment and how badly you want to live that, that next phase of the chapter rather than staying where you are. Obviously you have to reduce your costs and make a real detailed analysis because even just buying coffee every single day, it's uh you know, it drains your wallet over Correct. time. You know, and then the other aspect is time efficiency. You know, we don't realize how much time we spend on social media or how many time, how much we, we scroll or how much we watch TV or whatever. So in order to have that kind of commitment to living a better life and you have to really think about where's my time going. And then that's on the, the side of, okay, I need to eliminate stuff. But then also there's the, the phenomenon of um, net time, right? So when you're like driving or commuting to work, you can be listening to podcasts in the fields that you want to get into or reading 
you don't have to listen 100%. to music or you don't have to like, you know, listen 100%. to shitty podcasts or just like gossip, celebrity gossip or whatever. So um, there's so many ways to do it. And, you know, Gary Vee always talks about this is like, yeah, start a side hustle and really learn your lessons then and make the mistakes that you need to while you have the security of the nine to five pay. And then at some point, you know, it's like um, two acrobats, right? From uh, they're on a, like a perch and then they have to jump and then they have to catch each other. But at some point you have to let go of the previous one, the previous rod, and then get into the next one. So there's always going to be that risk factor that you're going to hit. But if you can minimize the risks, that's when you can, you know, really do it in the right. most efficient, positive way. Right. And, and I'd want to add to what you said about like going to work and stuff like that. Of course. And you don't even think that that's an, that's a problem. And it comes back to my ADHD where I stopped fighting my problems. I started to learn how to weaponize them to my advantage. I can't focus on one task. That's fine. I try to master the art of multitasking. And instead of listening to music, I listen to a pro- podcast while I code two different sites, while I check emails. And I, and, I, and I find that healthy middle ground where I don't fight the stream, but I work with it. So um, I definitely agree that there's so much we can do. And we have so much more time than we believe we do. And yeah, I, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, weekends instead of watching eight hours of football, where most people do, Correct. you know, it's uh, it's important to to be a little bit more mindful of that. So I want to get into like learning a little bit about, you know, you own several different businesses. The first time you were able to build a company, hit that inflection point. What did you learn from that experience, and then how did you apply it to the next businesses that you started? The problems with humans is that they like to stick with what they're comfortable with. You know, you find this area of expertise, and you've mastered a certain set of skills it becomes very hard to venture outwards because you're back to a student again. And people generally don't like putting on that student cap. And I think you should become very comfortable with putting on that student cap. So, and and this especially applies to the world of intangibles of zeros and ones. So when you're in computer science, you'll spend six months learning a language. You're learning PHP. You finally get some mastery of that. Before you know it, all these frameworks are now running JavaScript. And you got to start chasing JavaScript. And then you learn this specific JavaScript framework. And then, you know, you have this new JavaScript framework. And the moment you get complacent and comfortable, that's the moment you start to fall behind. It never really was like, it's this perfect art of not doing too much of everything, really honing in, mastering a set of skills. And then when you kind of see these patterns repeating, then you kind of just push outwards and you take these surrounding services and then you push outwards and you push outwards. And then you look back and you realize you kind of have all these isolated services you now offer. So to get specific here, I started doing web development building websites. And in fact, I wasn't even a designer. I was just a developer. Then I started realizing, hey, you know, why don't I start just doing better designs than CSS, right? I don't need to have someone best. Back at the time where Photoshop was what you would first do. You'd Photoshop Mm -hmm. the site, you'd slice it, and then develop it. Then I started realizing, you know, sometimes I'm correcting the designer and I'm like giving him design tips. Maybe I'm not as bad as a designer as I thought I was. Then I realized, hey, I'm actually a really good designer. Right. And then I said, hey, now I can do full. I'm full stack. I can do full out websites. And then every time I had a client, they go, oh, what about digital marketing? And what about hosting? I go, oh, I don't do that stuff. So here you can go use this hosting provider and you can just go use this um, th- this marketing team. And I'm like, hey, this this is like I'm looking down on these problems. Right. You know, I'm, although I'm a computer scientist, I can. Why don't I learn data communication? Right. And I have a data communication junior degree from college. Why don't I just leverage that? And then I started building my own servers. Where and, and, and the way I try to work here is that I oscillate between 80% work, 20% R&D, research and development. And then I go through phases where I'm 80% R&D and 20% um, work to keep things sustainable. But when I'm in learning mode, I am down in the bunker and I am completely learning a new set of skills. And, I'll, and that can go on from between one to four to five months depending on the situation. Then I have these sets of skills that I've mastered and then I move it back create internal infrastructure for it. So we have team members and I find all the hires. Everything that everything we do as a company, I have a very, uh, I have to have a very strong understanding of so that A, I can deal with emergency situations effectively, but I can also operate as an effective leader. So I know we're broadening the conversation here, but the secret, the secret, the underlying secret here is to not, even if you see a lot of monetary success in a specific area, SOP it. Find out where you're truly exceptional and needed within the system and delegate everything else. And usually it's a very small amount of work that, that you cannot be replaced in and everything else you can. Find team members who are really good, who match the culture of your company and delegate. Then you realize you have all this capital. Go to research phase, 
learn new skills, bring it back into the system. And before you know it, yeah, you are engaging in serial entrepreneurship. And the way it works is that you isolate these services and then you broaden them out, right? So it's more of just an inevitable byproduct of how I function as a person. And one yeah. thing I cannot do is whenever I see myself doing the same thing over and over again, I get very uncomfortable. And you know why? Because I remember how much I used to learn in college where I felt so behind and I had so much to do in such a short period of time. That gave me a huge amount of introspection of what I'm truly capable of. And the second I don't get that, that spark that I'm maximizing that or that I'm utilizing that potential whatsoever, I realize that I'm losing out. It's not about money. It's about skills. Because I look at money as a byproduct of doing something exceptional. Money is a byproduct of a stellar service. When you focus too much on money, and that's the trap with college students, we go out, we look at, hey, what's the economy paying, right? These are your most important years where you have to master an exceptional set of skills. And then money, when you do something truly unique that you truly love, money is inevitable. Yeah, it's a byproduct of, of success and phenomenal service. Thank you for that insight because, you know, as a small business owner, you know, I in the past, I spent so much time trying to wear all the hats in the company and not being able to be good at delegation. At the time, I was running around feeling completely drained and you know not doing any particular aspect of the business like phenomenally well. And then as I started realizing, okay, you can't do everything yourself, you're gonna burn yourself out and then you're not gonna be passionate about what you do. So then you have to start delegating. And I think that's a trap a lot of small business owners start with. Right. And really in order to, to scale into a big business owner, you cannot do everything yourself. It's, it's absolutely impossible for you to do that. So yeah, finding the right team members to kind of run the operations of the business that you don't really have the interest or willing to do the, the skill sets or, or willing to learn the skill sets to do. So how do you go about finding great team? Uh, what is your process for, for delegation? Great points, honestly. And to add to what you're saying, it comes to that scalability factor where a lot of things creep up on you in a very interesting way. Where you know you feel like you do have some grip on scalability when you bring your company up from one employee to five employees. And even when you go from five employees to seven, eight, nine employees, it doesn't feel that different. You can still use your current system and everything works fine. And then you get this weird place where you start adding just a few more employees and you get a few more clients. And then you realize your whole system's collapsing. You're like, how did, where, how did this happen? This is crazy. You know, you have this like, exponential effect where you have these tiny little inefficiencies that you can easily uh, work around, that you can easily brute force your way through them in the onset. But then when you have a bigger and bigger team, these things become exponentially more compounded. And then you have this question, do I optimize this current infrastructure, which is so much easier than the other option of completely tearing it down and rebuilding? And in order to see real success, you have to remove that inherent bias to want to do less work to continue. And you've got to be okay with, some, you know, I call it digital pyromania, digital pyromania, just completely being okay with ripping everything down in your online infrastructure and rebuilding. So hiring talent is one thing, and we'll definitely talk about that in just a moment, but also your internal infrastructure is equally important. When you start realizing that there are patterns to what you do, everything that I do now, I SOP it. I put it in like a one, two, three set of, skills, set of skills. And anytime I try to explain something to one person, I create it in a way that I can repurpose it. Because I don't know if this employee is going to come for a week or a month or two years, right? And at the same time, I'm going to have to tell to someone again. And I want to make sure the time I take to explain information or to onboard an employee has the least amount of work that goes wasted to that specific employee and the most amount of work that I can repurpose and reuse. So I use for having internal, and this takes months to figure out. You know, you want to set up your internal infrastructure. Do you want to use Slack? Do you want to use Notion? Do you want to use Monday? Do you want to use, you know, there are tons of project management tools. Uh, finding the one that's perfect for you can be very annoying because you can find yourself invested. What was the first one I used? I used ClickUp. Okay, everyone said ClickUp's the best, right? And it's great, right? And then I spent a ton of time building our initial company on ClickUp. And then I realized hey, there's a ceiling here. And I find myself preferring not to use ClickUp. And I realized, whoa, Notion is the king, absolute king for us. It took me like a month to move everything over. And I spent like two months building our ClickUp. Waste of time, but not really. It's about growth. ClickUp worked at the time. It clearly had its limitations within our current culture. So internal infrastructure, getting the right tools takes you a lot, a lot of time. Start watching YouTube videos where they compare one project management tool to another. You get a credible amount of insight in just a few minutes. That's the first thing. Second thing here is 
SOP your stuff, create your, your, your tasks that are very actionable and clear so you can easily start hiring new people and you can scale your hiring process because hiring is a real pain. Now, find talent, but there's twofold here. It's talent that's crucial, but it's also someone that maps your internal company, your, your internal company culture. If you've got a very um, soft-spoken internal process where everyone is like super polite and there's just a lot of, you know, I call it a bit of fluffiness in my opinion, but for many people, I see companies thrive under that condition. In our company, we're a lot more pragmatic. We're a lot more blunt. Um, we're a lot more business-oriented. We're not super emotional. Of course, we, we, we love each other and we respect each other, but at the same point, we're blunt when we see a problem. And, you know, and that's the kind of mentality we have. I don't want you to care about my feelings if I'm not doing something right. Right? I don't want you to intentionally try to hurt my feelings, but I do want you to tell me in a way that sends the message in the most effective way possible. And I want to find employees who have that sort of mentality because then my communication with them can be super efficient. Right Now, also, here's the thing. I'm in the digital world. Companies from 9 to 5 work from 9 to 5. We actually designed our system to work 24 hours a day. When I go to sleep, my team members know exactly where to pick up from. They know exactly how to increase, continue communication. So not only am I efficient, right? But at the same time, I'm doing three times more. People work eight hours a day. We kind of work 24 hours a day and we get a whole lot more time. So we've got this edge over our competitors, which is very, very interesting. And come back to this survival point here. What I find really interesting is people run away from being poor. Of course, no one wants to be poor, but I think being poor is the best optimizing tool. Right? When, I couldn't when, I, when I was starting out and I couldn't afford anything, I had to be super efficient with the people I work with. It's kind of like, you know, <laughs> I look at it this way with like the battle between Intel and the new um, Apple chips, where Intel is falling behind, significantly so, where, where they're not able to compete in the processing space, where, where, and when they've been only involved in it for years and you have Apple just completely taking over. Why? Right? You know, Intel started with a very brute force, super high power, and then saying, how do we optimize from here? While Apple said, I want to come up with these extremely lightweight. Our phones, our processors that power my MacBook is an optimized version of a processor that used to power my phone. They've taken these extremely lightweight. They've become extremely efficient with them. And then they built on that foundation, on a very efficient foundation. And I look at that very similar with business. When you have no resources, when you have someone who brute forces you with a whole lot of funding, you're not likely going to get the same yield with that money than you would if you have almost no money, right? And you need to really find the best talent at the best price. Obviously, you don't want to be starved too much because you might end up dying instead of breaking out. But you know, it's, like, it's about having eventually pushing up to that, to that middle ground. That all being said, starting off very small, really learning how to get the most yield with the least amount of resources is a very good carving point. Now, when I hire, you got to be patient. This is the key to hiring. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many people we go through until we find a single good hire. It is, it is so difficult. And I put all these trip wires in our um, at job applications. I ask questions that you know give me insight that almost seem meaningless, but they mean a lot to me. Uh, I'll give you an example. Right when I'm hiring abroad, one of the biggest issues are communication. I can find software engineers all over the world, right? But the problem is, and even if they're fluent in English, they're not necessarily fluent in American English. And I know that sounds weird, but it definitely translates. So in countries, for example, like the Philippines, when you find someone who's fluent in English, there's an element that fits really well because their English is almost has an American touch. They use the same lingo. You understand each other very well. And then you can have, you can speak English in a country like Pakistan, when you can speak fluent English in Pakistan. However, the, the way you word things is slightly different and that can sometimes create miscommunication. So it's not just about being a really good software engineer. It's also about having really good communication skills. In fact, I can teach programming on the job. It's not a big problem. What I can't teach is communication. It's very hard for me mm -hmm. to teach communication. So when I'm looking to hire, I would 10 times, 10x hire someone with good communication skills who's a bit of an amateur than hire a 10-year veteran who I'm going to have all these communications with because I'll be scared to send them clients. The clients are not going to understand each other. There's going to be friction. They're going to want me to come in. And the real value that the people you hire offer, the real value, if you think of this a little more abstractly, is not that they do services for you. It's that they allow you to only focus on what you truly do that's valuable, right? I have a very, you know, at the, at the highest level, I want to be using all my time to do things that are irreplaceable 
in terms of what makes me unique and why my company thrives is a very specific vision. And I want my company, and I'm, and I'm extremely um, fond of letting people do their own work. You know, I, I respect the technical process. I give people their work. And I also like people let me do that, you know, the way I do things at a very high level too. Anyways, all that being said, to circle back here, um, hiring, you have to be extremely patient. You don't want to find someone who kind of fits it, but you've gone through 30 applicants and no one was that good. You got to be willing to spend two, three months even finding one, one right person for that position. And there are some crucial things for hiring that you can't vet on paper. It's really, really hard. The flakiness factor, right? You're abroad. People don't come into the office every morning where after a few days, you know, you get to figure them out. Sometimes they disappear. Their grandmother, they're this, they're that. They're not here every day. Um, they're, and their resume looks super good. And there's some people who their resume didn't look that good. And I was about to let them go. And they were persistent. And they had so much heart. And they ended up being the best employees. And I couldn't I not imagine passing them today. So there's an element of surprise that comes with this stuff. But when, for example, I would put in, I would put in the job application. You know, you'd have to rate your English from one to ten. And I would define what one is and I would define what ten is. And then right away, anyone who gives themselves ten are usually like red flags. Right? <laughs> I give myself a ten, right? And I'm a native English speaker. And that to me is just you're just telling me what maybe I want to hear, or you've got like a delusional sense. And hey, listen. And then I ask them to write a paragraph about their services, right? So if their English is articulate and they're really good English, hey, you know, hey, I'm sorry, you are a 10, right? But if I'm seeing all these 101 grammar mistakes and they're giving themselves 10, everything down, the rate your PHP skills, rate your English skills, rate your client communication skills. If everything is 10, 10, 10, I'm usually out the door. That's to me, I'm done. Okay, this person is, the, the, the real talent comes with a sense of humility, right? Where they see flaws and they see improvement all the time. Those are the people who are very good. And generally, the people who are great give themselves a seven, an eight and a half, even on stuff they're very good at. So that's kind of an example of a tripwire I would put in the job application. And then also, I would also, one of the most important things is how do people handle stress? I can't really vet that. I can tell them how do you handle stress, but sometimes people are emotional and they don't really have a good frame of reference of how they are. I would sometimes artificially create a little bit of a stressful environment in the company. I would mm -hmm. be a little reactive when I'm not really that upset. And then I see how they double down. Do they take it emotionally or do they focus on the solution? And then they explain themselves. So I know it's a very long answer, but um, you know these are kind of things that I look for. And to me, the hiring process doesn't stop when I let them in the door. I give them a good two, three weeks, and then I get a more of a comfortable feel if they're fit. Yeah, it's it's a genius move to uh, you know to basically put them in situations that push them out of your comfort zones. Um, right. Maybe even setting up unrealistic tasks so that you can see how they deal with it, not just from a from a work perspective, but emotionally, right? Because you don't want anyone you know, folding under pressure during like when the real stress comes and then you're kind of eliminating <clears throat> people from the job application by having themselves do, do the elimination based on your, you know, the questions that you ask. So it actually right. saves and then you you're a lot left of time. Right, job and it's a mess. It's the mm -hmm. worst. It happens yeah. though. Yeah. But, I, I, I but again, rec recruiting is a job of its own and, and mm -hmm. it, take me, it took me a long time to, to refine the recruiting process, but to also develop the discipline to not give in to people that are kind of mediocre, but I'm generally very willing when I see very, a lot of heart and commitment, I'm definitely willing to try. Um, but I guess if you would ask me what the number one red flag, one number one thing that I cannot compromise on is communication. If the communication yeah. skills not there. It's not mm. going to scale yeah, because if you think about it, if you have to step in and you're scared that there's communication gaps, you're not really solving any problems, right? The whole idea is you want to completely remove yourself from the process so you can fully invest your energy somewhere else. Yeah, totally. Thank you for sharing that. It was really insightful. Um, let's switch over into things that you're really passionate about. I know you are uh, like a full-time traveler and you're, every time I talk to you, you're in a different city. So tell yeah. me about how, you know, how like you utilize your travel. Is it mostly for work? Are you doing it for pleasure? Um, what is your, I guess, your goals in traveling? To be very frank, I don't care very much about traveling. <laughs> I don't. Maybe I'm in a, maybe, a, you know, it's easy for me to say because it's, you know, I have the luxury of moving around, but whether I'm in Thailand or I'm here, I'm working all the time, all, all the time. So in fact, I'm not like partying and clubbing or sipping margaritas by the beach every night because um, I don't want that life, right? In fact, maybe I do deep down, but I see so much more enjoyment in building right now 
I see, I'm so much more excited to reach these milestones in my life, um, to reach financial goals, to reach certain successful goals in my life, that I look at all that as time wasted, right? Uh, and in fact, there's probably a flaw in that in and of itself that I need to push back and still enjoy being human to some extent and enjoy the moment more than I should. And I'm coming around to that. Um, but definitely when you, you and it's, it, it, it does slip up on you because as an entrepreneur, you're always trying to optimize and be more efficient and cut things out so you can get more done. And you're always just cutting these corners. And, and before you know it, you've cut out so much where you have no personal life and you're just working all the time. Um, so now on to traveling. I truly do enjoy it. Uh, it gives me a very good mental state when I'm constantly exposed to new environments. Um, I, I like to not have that pattern. Uh, and it's not that expensive. It really isn't. So when you learn how to, when you do it for long enough, you understand how it works. You get the right credit cards. Um, you build up those points very nicely. You find good deals. Um, you also build a really good network around the place. I have friends and people who I go by who have really big places and I make a deal with them. When I come in, I can rent out their place and they live at their own place for free and I get to, and it costs much less than hotels. Um, so, but, but yeah, I, I've definitely over time become a little pickier about my travel stay. I used to be truly, truly minimalist, but at this point I'm very a minimalist. I try to focus on growing my bank account and all the virtual world. And I try keeping my physical belongings as, as minimal as possible, but it's really all a means to an end. So I do want significant stability and I do want to build a place that I, that's beautiful that I call home. To me, it's just not my time yet, right? To me, I am, I'm in the building mode and I'm probably going to be in that mode for another year or two. Right now, I'm currently traveling way more than I normally do. So I've been to like six, seven different places in the past two months. Um, but generally, I'll stick in a place for two, three months and get some stability. So I'm not constantly, mm -hmm. constantly hopping around. But in a way, when I, in a way, this is part of the process of finding something that's truly stable. I want to be able to experience different areas. I want to be able to experience different opportunities. And then I become very confident where I want to invest all my money in to build. Um, so yeah, I enjoy traveling. I definitely do. But Here's what I'll say for the audience. It's a byproduct of this sort of way of functioning. It's not the main perk. And if you want to just travel all day and have fun, I promise you this is the worst decision. Following this work ethic is the worst thing you'll ever do because you're not going to mm -hmm. be traveling. You're not going to be partying all the time. You're just going to be working. So, you know, what, what I see about you is like you're so focused on the efficiency in creating the, the space where, you know, you could relieve yourself of these duties. Once you create like the whole slate is like completely like, you know, self-sufficient, the, the businesses and you create that time, are you going to go into, and you have been obviously, but you're going into building more stuff or is there ever a point where you want to just be like, okay, I'm really happy, satisfied with where I am. And now maybe I want to do some more stuff for personally. I want to get involved in other, other things outside of, you know, just the business nature. Do you have those goals or are you still really into the building? Really, really good question. Uh, I'm always going to be building. I can see myself constantly building. But you remember I told you about that 80-20? Uh, I'm definitely going to – there's times where I'll – I'm always going to have an element in my life where I'm doing R&D. Um, but I think what you asked is really good. It brings up a, a deeper philosophy in how I function. I try to create these structures that I leverage – and I have these like milestones. So I'll build all these independent companies. I'll build a hosting company, a web development company, scale my publication, a startup that builds news publications, scale my podcasts, which were in development, uh, a startup that does podcast management, Hexa Book Services, where we write books. These are all these independent services. And it's kind of weird where this is going. But to be honest, I want to head my next major milestone is VC. I want to jump into the venture capital space. So now I have all this um, experience in Internal, internal flow optimization, in software engineering as a developer, um, in learning how to scale and grow companies. So I do feel like now when I enter VC, I'll have a unique advantage point in that space. Not only will I be able to vet technical companies, uh, well, tech startups and whatnot, and be in a good place with having years of experience, but at the same time, I'll be able to reduce their costs by giving them access to incredible resources that manage all of their online works. So, you know, it's kind of like in a much more of a macro scale, these startups are going to be leveraged for my next step. And if I were to get super philosophical here, I would say that once I do 
make a strong footprint in the VC world. And I meet incredible founders who have extremely innovative ideas. I think I'm going to start touching into something much deeper uh, in terms of what I'm deeply passionate about. And that's human aging and biology. It's not my time. I spent nothing but science. I spent nothing but doing science for 10, 15 years. And now I'm completely in the finance world. In the past four, three, four years, I've done very little science. Very little. It doesn't mean that I'm moving away from it, but right now I'm focused on building infrastructure, finding financial success. Then I'm going to start worry, working and building an angel network, a VC network of extremely high functioning, talented individual people. And I'm not sure where this will go, but I'm sure I'll find someone doing interest, something interesting in biology. And then I'll want to make a, a, a deeper move and focus on something for the next 10, 15 years of my life. So it's kind of like you work in these pockets where you create these systems and then you move to this completely new ecosystem and then you leverage your success on there and it has this iterative process. And when you look at it, like the relationship kind of seems weird on the outset, but they really, everything truly is connected. Amazing. What do you think uh, in terms of, you know, because I'm in the biohacking space as well, I'm in, really into wellness and optimizing human performance, human aging, where do you see the future of human aging? What technologies do you see as most promising? Uh, okay, so... The problem here is that a lot of the, you know, I, I'll get a little meta here for just a moment. So if you were to go back just a few hundred years, even relative to the existence of humans, and I would tell you that you would have these boxes that transport you from one place in the world to another in just a few hours, and you have these things you hold in your hand, and you're able to send a message to someone across the world, you'd have the witches of your time tell you that you're crazy, right? You're going to get burned and alive. <laughs> right. And here we are, we get text messages and we're not blown away every time a text message comes in. Mm. So it's even the framework of conversation significantly changes. And we're, you know, we're subject, we're not evolving anymore in a Darwinian phase. We're evolving at a, at a, at a Morse phase of exponential growth. I think the time frame of those conversations is becoming shorter and shorter where, you know, even four or five years from now, where you can look at like my phone, right? This just a few years ago was the coolest thing. Just literally a few years ago was the coolest thing because I played music. Right. But it was a phone. Right. Now it's like, by the way, this is a phone. It literally does everything else. Right. And that what that happened. That's not we're not talking witches here. We're talking, you know, my childhood less than 10 years ago. And I do think we're going to come to realize that we're almost like we're we've in terms of the human problem, the aging problem. We're just we focus a lot of our time buying bigger and bigger buckets to stop the flood. We need to start coming at the heart of the issue and actually stop the flood itself. And we've evolved, we've evolved to, to become okay with aging and dying, right? And we found these very strange ways to live on. We found ways to live on by living in the minds of other people, right? We're not talking about John Doe from 1932, who was a blacksmith, but we are talking about Albert Einstein every single day. And that's how he found a way to live on, by living in the minds of other people. Also, it's why we evolve and we see such a value in building a family. It's because we pass on our genes, and that's one way to live on. But we've never entertained the idea that we can actually live on because there were no options for it. So, you know, it's almost like cognitive dissonance. Our mind just found ways to cope, cope with it in, in other ways. Now, I do think that we need to start asking a very serious question. Is how do we extend human life at a core level? I'm not talking about modern science where we start eating healthier and running more. I'm talking we understand how cells age and we see that as not, you know, you know, we see it as like death and dying as more of like or aging as an actual disease, not as something that happens and we're all human and no one can escape death. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm sure you hear this a lot in, in, the, in the biohacking world, but I do believe humans alive today will, will pass the 500-year mark. And... Um, we still have some real core issues we need to understand. It's like, what does it mean to be human? And, and what does it mean to age? And, and you know, biological systems are great, but they're not very fault tolerant. So, you, you know, it's the way we look at a bird and flying in the sky and we say, hey, you know, let's look at this a little more abstractly, rebuild it with ideal mechanics. And not only can we go across the world, but now we can go to different planets, right? And I think we need to look at this body as the same way. Uh, cyborgism, you know, that sounds like stuff like the weird people talk about or, you know, or nerds or geeks discuss or comic books. But I do think that's going to enter the mainstream conversation very, very soon, that um, we're going to realize that our heart is not the ideal biological system to pump our blood. In fact, we can create uh, mechanized systems that are extremely fault tolerant, that can do a much better job than our biological heart. Then we're going to start replacing it. And we're going to start replacing our arm. And then we're going to start replacing And then we're going to start coming to core questions, right? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be alive? Right? Uh, you know, at first, many years ago, we thought that a heart is what makes us unique that uniqueness factor. And then we say, no, it's the brain. You can't get a brain transplant. 
But then you can start breaking that down into isolated you know, compartmentalization. You have your prefrontal cortex. If I took someone and I removed their prefrontal cortex, will they still be them? And most of us would say yes. And I went through every the amygdala, and I went through every single compartment of the brain, and then I removed just that one part. You would still say that person is that person. I think it's our collective experiences to some extent, and I'm definitely not a professional in this area to, to, to give you know, deeper, deeper thoughts, but, but I strongly believe the question of consciousness will help us get more of a grip of what direction we want to head in. And um, I, I think when we understand what makes us us, then we'll start focusing on this is, now, this is the process we want to conserve and replicate or transfer on. And we're going to realize maybe our body is a great limitation of who we are as a person. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's the first point. Now, moving it more to something more tangible, I think the question becomes, when you're talking about biohacking, is I was telling you how cyborgism is going to play a more prominent role in the future. Well, technology is going to be fusing, and it's, it's this amazing relationship where, where everything we see in, in life that we've created was inspired by biology, right? You know, we'll, we'll, example, we'll see a bird, we'll make an airplane, right? We, we see, what a computer, a computer emulates a person. It's got, per, it's got input output devices, it's got a speaker, it's got an ear, it's got a brain, it's got a CPU. Now you're seeing, well, in even how computers function, slightly more optimized on a base two system, where you have binary zeros and ones, and we as human beings operate on a base, base four system, right? We're looking at our DNA. Now you're seeing this weird flip where now we're using technology to inspire biology. And I think the real question here is, and, and I know you asked uh, to answer your question now, um, the question really does become whether we're going to get a lot more output by optimizing our current biological structure or we're, whether we're going to get more output by recreating these structures with more ideal materials. Yeah. And I personally believe <clears throat> that we're advancing so quickly that we're starting, quickly going to start realizing that we get much more output and much more long-term sustained value by rebuilding systems, ideally. Yeah, And having a metal arm or replacing your heart with something that's not biological whatsoever is probably going to take a very quick, uh, it's probably going to have a very big market in the shortcoming, in the near future. Um, and I do think that like, the best medical professionals will be people who are highly qualified software developers or technical people. It's a very weird concept right now, and it's not something that people might resonate with, but the playing field changes very quickly. And you have to realize yeah. that it's 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 we're entering a chaotic phase where we're really accelerating technologically at a very fast pace where we don't have as much predictive power of exactly where we're going as we used to so i, I you know and this to come back to earth here um that's why i do think that we need to diversify our skill sets even economically speaking because you have stuff like covid that are great stress tests in terms of how we've carved ourselves for survival Right when you have a very narrow set of skills in a very narrow domain, you have COVID. It can be extremely disruptive, right? And then, or or if you have, you know, the future belongs to those who innovate and people who do have a wider set or a career portfolio, where they've got multiple streams of revenue and they've got the types of skills that have multiple degrees of freedom. Where you know, for example, as a software developer, you can go into gaming, you can go into finance, you've got a whole lot to do as opposed to being someone who has a, a brick and mortar store, you know, and COVID, COVID comes and then they're reliant on their client base within their community and then they're in trouble. So, you know, to bring all this down back down to earth, I, I think having a healthy ground of long-term projection and then preparing with many degrees of freedom, with a lot of diversified skills and planning ahead, I think is just truly important. Wow, what what an answer! <laughs> That's uh, there's so much to think about when it comes to you know technology and man and consciousness and at some point yeah we're going to optimize every aspect of our our biology in order to become technology and then we're left with maybe the brain is the last thing but you look at like neural net and what Musk is doing and several other you know companies that are working on the brain you know helping paralysis all that kind of stuff so at some point then we have to ask the question what is it to be human and then if you look at it from a spiritual perspective what is consciousness and is conscious do we have a soul and if we become totally machine then what happens to our soul when that machine ends right right so there is so much to think about it's like uh it's a little overwhelming but i really think that everything is going to happen so fast like you said right. in the next i would say next 10 years we're going to be totally different in terms of our long-term approach to, you know, what what health and, and biology is. It's right. uh, it could be right. the best of times and, and the worst of times. It really and depends to bring on Web three, and yeah. to bring into Web three and blockchain into all this. You know, forgetting about 
what specific opportunities it will present. What the, to me, what the blockchain is, is an extremely, is a system that removes bureaucratic structures, which removes inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it removes the need for people to do trust, to verify, to be passed through different systems, and you have all these different auditing processes. Blockchain is a way of ensuring integrity within a system. And this will create, this will allow for companies to grow a lot quicker. And this will allow for innovation. And the second companies can grow quicker, we're getting more and more advanced. So I do think that it's spiraling out of control. It really is. And I, I think people who are seeing, who are planning for 10, 15 years from now are the ones who might be very successful in the future. It's all quite exciting. And, and honestly, I think the conversation will shift based on some core questions of like who we are and what makes us us and what makes us unique and consciousness and all this weird stuff. But um, one thing I am unsure about is, is how long it'll take us to uh, answer the question of consciousness. I feel like that's yeah. a very, <laughs> very deep question. Uh, well, have we you ever done psychedelics? <laughs> no, I haven't, but I, I should okay. probably entertain the idea at some you point. Might, you life. might get some answers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, as far as I've gone is listening to Sam Harris for, for longer yeah. than I should, but uh, yeah. Very interesting. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Mikey. So why do you think you came here to, to planet Earth and what did you want to experience in this in this uh, life of yours? I don't know. Um, I, I deeply want to leverage my success to make a profound impact on humanity. I hope to make a contribution to human aging or to be involved in that ecosystem and that space to some extent. Um, in terms of what I vision, I envision my house in five, 10 years from now to be some place by the beach where I get to relax in the mountain, with the beautiful view. But what I really envision is having this second floor, completely glass, and I have down the center all my technical infrastructure and then all my biological infrastructure. and. I live in a hermit. Like I live like like in this like you know like in the movies where these guys live in the forest in the middle of nowhere and they do their own stuff. That's kind of where I see myself being happy, and I do see myself working with incredible people uh, who are not working with you know like DARPA hard problems. You ever heard of DARPA? Yeah. So so DARPA hard pro like DARPA is a is, is a is a U.S. military facility or company that does. They create those uh, uh, those robotic dogs and uh, robotic machines. <laughs> right. So they're they're not interested in problems. Even if like they're very complex and innovative solutions, they're not interested in those. They're in interested in disruptive, completely weird, crazy ideas that no one wants to touch. That's the stuff they're interested in. And I kind of want to work on. And the problem is called DARPA hard. Right? I kind of want to mm -hmm. focus on DARPA hard problems in the next 15 years and 10 years of my life. Uh, I definitely want to have a great family too. So, you know, and that's the, finding the middle ground between those two would be interesting. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're such an inspirational guy and I, I learned so much and we definitely have to do this again and maybe go a little bit deeper into blockchain and, and futurism and, and, and all this kind of stuff. There's, there's so much to talk about in this uh it's an amazing world we live in. It's it's like a limitless possibilities, right? And it all depends on how each of us, you know, what mark we make on the world. And you know, talking to someone like you, it's like clear that you have a an amazing vision, how you want to contribute. And uh, you know, I just see you you growing and expanding. And uh, actually, we do share the same birthday, I believe. I think I saw somewhere you have January thirteenth is your birthday. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Super me cool. too. Me too. Yeah. And by the way, thank you for having me on your show. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. Sure. I, don't, I don't know the time. I can ask my mom. Yeah. But uh, that's incredible. And, and also, thank you so much for having me on your show. I truly appreciate it. I feel like I've learned so much by just talking to you. And even before we got on the podcast, we got on a phone call. And I was truly inspired um, by how succinct you were, how great you were at communicating, and all your successes. So um, I really felt like I learned a lot here. And thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Mikey, how can we learn more about you? What's, uh, what's the best way to, uh, for the uh, audience to find you? For the most part, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Everything's M-I-K-E-Y-P-E-R-E-S, Mikey Perez, one word, that's my username. And my website is michaelperez.com, uh, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-P-E-R-E-S.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.